Hi everyone. I want to introduce a different way of thinking about relativity that is a little bit more palatable, I think, to our conceptions of what's going on. And in other words, I want to kind of explain why one might expect length contraction and time dilation to occur. And that's something called the space-time interval, and I'm calling it the Rosetta Stone. It's the thing that kind of makes relativity understandable, acceptable, you know, a way of, of, of dealing with it. And so I want to start here with um, time dilation, basic formula for time dilation. And if you sit there and rearrange that formula, you can rearrange it in this form. Basically, you need to take the velocity, break it into v over t, and I'm sorry, take the velocity, break it into x over t, rearrange it, and this is the formula that you get. The interesting thing about this formula is that on the left-hand side, we have our time, space and time measurements, or at least this is our perception of the space and time measurements that occur in the moving system. On the right-hand side, we have um, the, the time interval that happens between two um, particular events in space-time. The thing about the right-hand side is that it's constant. It doesn't change. And so what this tells us is that we um, see that there is a relationship between the way in which space and time change. They change together. They change in such a way to maintain this constant here. So if the time increases, the, the x, the distances have to decrease, right? And so this shows us in kind of a compact, y, compact way that if we have time dilation, we must have length contraction. They go together like this in order to maintain something called the space time interval. And that's what this formula represents. So if we were to calculate two between any two events, regardless of how fast that system is moving. So if, if I measure, you know, if I imagine, you know, a flash of light occurs here, and then that flash of light is observed over here, there's a distance in time, a distance in duration uh, between those two events. And if I imagine that laboratory is moving, is at rest, I measure those things. If I imagine it's moving at a certain speed, I measure those things. I imagine it's moving at a different speed, measure those things again and again and again and again. I'm always going to get different t values and x values because of length contraction, time dilation. But this combination is always the same. And so this is called the space-time interval. Now, that is as far as we can get, really. Um, the one extra way to kind of consume this is to look at this and say, you know what? That kind of reminds me of Pythagorean's theorem. It's got a minus sign in there, which is weird. But Pythagorean's theorem does something similar in that I've got a, a distance, we're talking about real distance now, and if I measure the x and y components of that distance, I'm going to get different values depending on the orientation of my reference frame, right? So I'm going to get this x value here, but here I'm going to get a larger x value because the system's rotated. That rotation is not really fundamental to this distance, right? It's just the way in which I'm perceiving that distance, right? The, the reference frame, you know, uh, represents, the, these values represents the combination of the reality and my perception. But I can combine these x's and y's together squaring them and adding that product, um, adding those squares, and that gives me a square of the distance. That, dis that number is always the same. And so we kind of have a similar thing going on here. If I measure the interval, space-time interval, between two points, um, the di their distance in time, space and the distance in time, multiplied by c in order to get this right, and then square that and take the difference, though, in this case, I'm going to get the same number regardless. And so in kind of a, it's stretching things a little bit, but in a sense we can say 
that when we are measuring objects or when we measure systems that are in motion, that's kind of very similar to the way in which we measure systems that are rotated from one another. And we're willing to accept the fact that x's and y's are different when we rotate them because we know that the x's and y's are a combination of reality and perception. Well, the same thing is happening here in that our notions of space and time are a combination of reality and our perception. And this logic that we go from time dilation down to this formula, which defines the space-time interval, was exactly the same mathematics we went from the definition of momentum to this combination of energy and uh, momentum formula. And so this is showing, again, the, the logic that unites both space and time in this space-time interval is the same as the unity that occurs between energy and momentum. And notice in this case, though, the quantity that's um, connected to the, the thing that's constant is the rest mass here, okay? So we've got energy and momentum combined together through their squares and the difference of those squares. The same thing's happening here. So there's a real strong parallel between these two formulas.